Good morning. By faith, we have been joined together with our, our living Savior. And that means for us life and salvation. And that new life then shows itself in our lives lived here on earth as we, we seek to follow the Lord's will and His Word in all that we say and do. I'll follow the order of service as you have it in your bulletin. We begin with our opening hymn, Hymn 470, Like the Golden Sun Ascending. stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. 
I have lo loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins. With his innocence, suffering, and death, trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all people, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. Let us pray. O God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Yeah. Maybe seated. First lesson is recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, 
brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join to sing Psalm 63.
Our second lesson is recorded in 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 18. Dear children, <clears throat> let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and He knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything, <coughs> anything we ask because we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. And this is His command, to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in Him and He in them. And this is how we know that He lives in us. We know it by the Spirit He gave us. The Word of the Lord. Please stand and we join to sing the Gospel Acclamation. is recorded in John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. May we see that we join to sing hymn 469.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Word of God for our meditation this morning, our second lesson recorded in 1 John chapter 3. Fellow disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone has a need to feel loved. And we want to, to feel accepted and appreciated that we're worth something. But the, what do we often see in our world? What we often see is, is a lack of love. Unwanted children so unloved that they're killed in the womb. People so lonely they commit suicide. Those so desperate for love that they grasp for the, the physical love of promiscuous sex. Or the elderly people in nursing homes or prisoners in jail. Forgotten, never receiving visitors. And too often, we also are unloving. Now we have a responsibility to love others, but how cold and selfish we are by nature. Our love is often limited to those closest to us or to those from whom we might receive some benefit. Instead of a gift, our love is sometimes withheld or given to control others. You know, it's, it's not love that causes a spouse to, to criticize their partner's every little fault. It's not love that withdraws affection from a child until he behaves. It's not love that shirks our responsibility to rebuke the sinner or to correct and discipline children. And we have to confess that our love, even as Christians, is inadequate. But God's love is not. God's love has no limits. At the beginning of this chapter, the Apostle John points us to the tremendous love of God. In verse 1, John writes, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And just a couple verses before our, our reading, John points us to the greatest example of God's love. And how that then will affect our relationship with others. In verse 16, John writes, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And God's love has no limit. Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross for you. God provides the love that we need no matter how the rest of the, the world may treat us. And that love then changes our lives. To so live in Jesus' love. Trust His love and then work to reflect that love in your life. Now we've been connected to Jesus. Jesus told us in our gospel reading, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Now because of that connection, we have life and salvation. And connected to Jesus, we now are able to do good works. We're able to love others. Now those good works that we do, the, the love that we show to others, those are signs of that faith the Lord has worked in our hearts. And while we know that those good works don't in any way contribute to our salvation, John points out that they do give an assurance and a confidence. Again, because they're evidence of that connection to Jesus. But where ultimately is our greatest assurance and comfort? What is it that truly provides us with security? Where do we find true peace of mind? Now, I suppose that many in our society look to things like their possessions, finances, 
If they're financially protected, they feel secure. But consider, a life insurance policy isn't going to keep anyone from dying. Health insurance doesn't keep a person from getting sick. The wealth and possessions that are acquired over a lifetime can be wiped out in an instant. Now we find real peace of mind only when we find refuge in the precious wounds of our crucified Savior. We find real security when we have the assurance that through His blood our sins have all been forgiven and that by His resurrection we too will be raised to eternal life in heaven. But are you sure of Jesus' love for you? Are you sure that your sins are forgiven? Are you sure that you will go to heaven? Now, easy it is to doubt God's love for us. Now, the, the guilt of sin can weigh heavy on our minds at times. Our, our conscience speaks up against us. Conscience tells us, well, a real Christian would never do something like that. A real Christian would never think that. Now, the devil not only tempts us to sin, but once the devil gets us to sin, he's very good at pointing out all of our failures. And he uses those sins to accuse us and to try and drive us to despair, to, to doubt God's forgiveness. And when our conscience then troubles us, when we're tempted to doubt God's love and forgiveness, to think, well, I'm not someone that God could love. Well, John reminds us, God is greater than our hearts and He knows everything. Yes, God knows our sins. He knows every last one of them. He knows the times that we have failed to show love to others. He knows the times that we have been selfish. He, he knows those sins even that we aren't aware of. The King David prays in Psalm 19, Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. So God knows the sinners that we are better than even we do. But God also knows that He chose us in Christ. But God took all of our sins, the sins of the whole world, and placed them on our Savior Jesus. Jesus went to the cross and suffered the punishment for our sins. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when we feel as though our sins can't be forgiven, that we're so bad that we could never get to heaven, we're in effect saying to, to God that, that, that our sin is greater than God's grace. We're telling God that, that He's wrong when He says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. God tells us in Christ Jesus He has forgiven us. And it's true. And yet, sometimes a person feels unsure of that salvation. Well, their, their heart condemns them. They tell them that they're maybe not sorry enough for their sins. But even then, if, if we feel that we need to be more sorry, to repent more deeply, it really shows that, that we still have a tendency to, to trust in our own works to save us. And we're imagining that, that God will only be merciful to us because of something we do. Again, a tendency to trust our own works to save us. God doesn't forgive us because we're sorry. He forgives us because Jesus died on the cross for us. Now, sorrow over sin is not some condition necessary to earn God's forgiveness. And we can never earn God's forgiveness. Well, the wages of sin is death. It's, it's not tears and sorrow. Sorrow over sin is necessary for one thing, to make us realize how much we need our Savior's forgiveness. If it's made us see that, then it's really done everything that it's supposed to. Well, none of us truly could ever be sorry as we ought to be. And we should let our sorrow drive us to trust in the promises of God, 
God who is greater than our hearts and who knows all things. Now we look, or we make a great mistake really when we look for certainty of salvation in our own heart in any way. And yet, too often that's the case. We look to our, our faith as evidence that we're saved. I, I believe in Jesus, I live a Christian life, and the emphasis gets shifted to the wrong place. It's on us. And even a statement like, well, all you have to do is believe, can very easily become an improper focus on ourselves. You know, the decision theology that is so much a part of American Christianity it tells you that you have to accept Christ. It, again, places a little emphasis on me. There's something that, that I must do, accept and believe. But if, if we're involved in any way in our salvation, well, there has to be doubt. Did I do enough? Did I believe enough? Jesus died for all people. If he died for all people, whether they are believers or not, if a person does not believe, that does not change the truth of God in any way. Apostle Paul reminds us of that fact in 2 Timothy. He says, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. God is always completely true to his word. And God tells us that in Christ Jesus, he has forgiven all of our sins. And he didn't forgive me because I believe. He forgives me because of what Jesus has done. Our heart may tell us that Jesus did not die for us, but God's word tells us that he did. It doesn't depend upon our feelings. It, it simply doesn't depend upon us at all. And so we don't look for comfort and certainty of our forgiveness and salvation anywhere other than Jesus. His cross, His empty tomb. And there I can be sure of God's love and forgiveness. That salvation is an objective fact. And it's true that unbelief rejects and forfeits those blessings won by Christ. And again, our salvation is entirely dependent on Him and not ourselves. The Apostle Paul reminds us, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. And so the believer has learned to look away from those killing requirements of the law. He understands that all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. And as far as our salvation is concerned, our works count for nothing. And so we turn from a trust in them, trust in our own obedience to God's commandments, and with joy, it's except the one command in our reading to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, that even that ability to believe is a gift of God's grace. And that faith in Jesus then will not be without results in our lives. Now, Jesus wants us to be fruitful, productive Christians. He wants us to find joy in serving Him and serving those around us. And so we're to show love to others. We're to live and act in a way that really is very different from the world around us as we seek not our own good, but the good of others. How bright such actions shine in the dark corners of this sinful and often loveless world. But those good works then show that we are connected to Jesus. They reflect His love. And the Lord doesn't give to us, you might say, a, a duty roster or a long list of chores to be done every day. But He sets before us in His Word the opportunities to bear fruit. He provides us with many opportunities to serve Him every day as we serve those around us in love. Now Jesus, the night before His crucifixion, told His disciples, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. 
By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And just before that, Jesus had demonstrated that love, that service, by stooping to wash his disciples' feet, willing to do even the job of the, the lowest slave. And that's the fruit which Jesus wants us to produce. And fruit which connected to him and empowered and motivated by him, we will produce. And so our, our Savior's great love for us, we will seek to reflect that in our lives. Out of love and thanks for our Savior's love for us, we love others. Even those, I suppose we might say, who in a sense don't deserve our love. And in loving others, well, we love Jesus. And that love too, it's more than just some nice words. Love acts. Love acts to do what is best for that person. The Apostle James writes, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, our love for our Savior will lead us to to love in a way that he did. Uh, his love moved him to act. It moved him to humble himself, to become our substitute under the law, to suffer our punishment. Now be sure, as we consider Jesus' love for us, we're going to fall short of that. At best, our love for others will be a, a dim reflection of our Savior's love for us. But as the Apostle John writes a chapter earlier, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, Jesus' love for us, then, is our power and our motivation to love others. So can I be sure that God loves me? Can you be sure that you are forgiven and that you will go to heaven? In Christ Jesus, the answer is yes. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look to the cross, look to the empty tomb. In Jesus, God declares you not guilty. He says that you are his dearly loved child. He promises you an eternal inheritance in the glories of heaven. God has spoken. Uh, there can be no doubt about his love for us or about our salvation. And knowing God's love for us then, well, that frees us then to love those around us as we seek to reflect that love in our lives every day to everyone. Amen. Peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us join and make confession of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
the Holy Spirit impress us with a great urgency of preaching the gospel of our crucified and risen Savior to every creature and the importance of giving regular generous gifts to this work. Teach us that we do not lose what we give, but that our offerings are sound investments, helping to assure a blessed eternity to others. Make our giving not only responsive to the needs of souls redeemed by Christ, but responsive, responsive also to His great love for us. In His name we pray. Amen. Almighty God and Father, we thank You for all Your mercies, especially for the gift of Your Son, through whom You have revealed Your gracious will. We praise You for the Holy Spirit and His working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend Your Church, that by Your Word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.